Good morning. You will please stand and join us in worship. Your love so great, Jesus in all things. I've seen a glimpse of your heart for a billion years. Still I'll be singing. How can I praise you enough? How can I praise you enough?
I'll shine in all the stars I'll see the glory Your love is like the wildest ocean Oh, nothing else can be there Amen Good morning and welcome to Stuart Heights so good to see each and every one of you this morning. Um, if we will, take a couple minutes, shake hands, and greet one another. I'm Zach, and I'm the senior worship leader here at Stewart Heights, and I'm very excited about the spring music season that we're about to start. It's my hope that we live 2024 with a renewed passion for worship. It's a great time to get plugged into our worship teams, whether it's in the band, orchestra, serving in the back on the tech teams with audio and visual, or maybe it's the choir. Our choir gathers twice a year, once for our Christmas program and then for our Easter service, which takes place at Coolidge Park. While it's so easy to get caught up in the stuff that everyday life brings, I want our weekly choir rehearsal to be something more. I want it to be a refuge from the stuff that we're chasing and a time of worship, not just a task on your to-do list. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, As each of you have received gifts, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. So what gifts do you have? Where are you serving? Come serve with us in the worship ministry. Easter Coolidge is just around the corner, which means our spring choir season kicks off tonight at 5 p.m. at the Hickson campus. I'd love to have 100 voices this year at singing in the choir, which is a big goal, but this choir season is only eight weeks long. It's not a huge time commitment, but it's a very important one. So we'd love to have you come worship with us. Join us tonight at 5 p.m. at the Hickson campus. Everyone's welcome, no matter what your skill level is. If you'd like more information, you can reach out to me at zach at stuartheist.org.
Amen. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time to come into your house and to fellowship, to worship, to hear the reading of your word, to study your word. Father, again, as we've sang, you have been so good to us and you have counted us as worthy when we were unworthy, but the only reason that we have worth is because of what your son did for us at the cross. So, Father, we celebrate again this morning. Father, help us to celebrate as we go throughout our week that we will be reminded of the truth of the gospel, that we will be reminded of the value of the gospel in every situation we face and in everything that we do. Father, we thank you that we can turn to you in our suffering, that you know what our hearts are going through, what our minds are going through. Father, we thank you for your love. Father, I pray that you'll lead us through this time today. I pray that you'll speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. I pray that you'll be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. In the face of great adversity, overwhelming obstacles, daunting challenges, Fears of failure in doubt. The believer needs to know that they are not alone, that they can persevere, they can overcome, they can find victory that comes in their relationship with God. God and us. Scripture teaches that. God is for us, God is with us, God is challenging us, that God is among us. Is God and us. If God is for us, then who or what can be against us? Yes, uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to look at a series of messages called God and Us. And uh, uh, we're coming out of a 2023 and going into 2024. And uh, let me ask you something. Everybody ready for 2024? How, how many did New Year's resolutions? Hold your hand up. If you did a New Year's resolution, you're kidding me. Nobody? <laughs> There's about three or four right there. I mean, uh, I got challenged with the New Year's resolution. I'm, I'm a bad nail biter, okay? Anybody else bite nails out there? All right. I mean, uh, I, you can tell and. Uh, I, I made this vow. I, I am not going to chew my nails anymore, all right? And, uh, and then a football game came on last week, Sunday night. They were winning big time, and uh, I was doing fine, and I lost three nails here, all right? I just chewed all over these things, and uh, so I thought, they're going to pull it out, they're going to pull it out, and they blew it right there, all right? But I'm back to it, okay? I'm, I got some nails over here. My wife's pretty excited. She thinks that's great that I'm not chewing nails. I think it's when she goes in the car and looks and sees all these little white dots everywhere and stuff like that on the dashboard. But anyways, uh, I hope you have some New Year's resolutions. Uh, one of the things we used to do as a church, and I wish we would have thought about this ahead of time, is challenging everybody else in our church to have the greatest year spiritually that you've ever had. And I'm serious about that. 
It, it begins with a decision that you make, and it begins early, and it's sticking to what you have. Maybe have an accountability partner or something like that. I'd be, I'd be curious to see how many people have said they're going to make a commitment to reading the Word of God on a regular basis. Uh, what we did, we set it up to do it where you could do it with us as a church. We could all go through it together, and we're doing it um, uh, canon uh, canonically rather than chronologically. And uh, so we're reading through. If you're reading through with us, you should be in the book of Leviticus uh, this week and uh, finishing that one off. But uh, I, I would challenge you to do that. I would challenge you to get in the Word of God on a daily basis. How about this one? Church attendance. Ooh, we got real quiet here, okay? <laughs> How about church attendance? Um, you know, it's, it's what you make of, make of it, all right? And uh, uh, I always like to let folks know, if you got children, I can tell you this. Uh, Sunday school and church is a Saturday night decision if you have kids, right? You don't start getting them ready for church the next day and everything the, the, when they get up in the morning. Okay, now we got to get ready. No, you, you have to do that Saturday night to be able to, to be effective in that. But I would like to challenge you. Not, I, I understand that everybody can't be here every week. We have folks that work in hospitals and work uh, different situations and jobs that they're not able to come. But I would like to have you challenge. And uh, like if you came 20 times last year, um, if you ask me what, what should be your new goal, I'm the wrong person. Because if you ask me how many Sundays you should be here, ready? <clears throat> All of them. Every one of them, all right? But understand, there are things. There's vacations. There's uh, people that work, all that. But I would challenge you to, to make church attendance a priority in your life, that it's not secondary or thirdly uh, on your list. Uh, not only that, but uh, uh, we sing about, here, here's one of our old favorite. Anybody remember singing about the sweet by and by? In the sweet by Well, we can sing about the sweet by and by, but let me be straight up. We live in the nasty now and now. And since we live in the nasty now and now, I think people need to step up and take their gifts and abilities that God has given to you and serve in the body of Christ. It, it, you, you, we, you, it may be a Sunday school teacher. You may be a greeter. You may be something else, uh, a prayer warrior or something. But I would challenge you to find your spiritual gift and get plugged in and use it for the body of Christ. It's going to be all about God and us, and we can have the greatest year spiritually. If you make that decision that you want to make a difference in this world... God's going to give it to you. You know why? God is for you. God is for you. And that's what we're going to talk about today. God is for us. God is for us. And if, when it comes to New Year's resolutions, <clears throat> lay those out. Lay those out. Matter of fact, I saw a New Year's prayer. I thought this was interesting. It says, Dear God, so far, so far this has been great. I haven't gossiped about my friends. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, cruel, or rude. And I'm very thankful. But in a few minutes, Lord, I'm going to get out of bed. And then I'm pretty sure I'm going to need your help. You know what? Uh, we need God's help. And God is more than happy to make a difference in your life, to allow you to have the greatest spiritual life that you've ever had this year. But it's a choice and a decision that you have to make. I want you to take and turn your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. God is for us. And uh, right off the bat, I want to say this. God is for us in warfare. If, if you're going to make a difference, if you want to have the greatest year spiritually you've ever had, I can promise you this. There's going to be all kinds of battles that you fight. Uh, there are going to be battles, uh, whether there's uh, uh, family battles or uh, co company va uh, battles, educational value, all these different things that you're going to have to deal with. But uh, God is for us in warfare. God is for us in warfare. So what I want to do is to, uh, talk about what's going on in our world today. When I talk about God is for us in warfare, um, the Bible is very clear about some of the warfare that happened in the Old Testament. You go through the Old Testament, there's all kinds of battles and wars that are taking place. And we're talking about physical battles, physical wars. Almost like what we got facing today in the culture and the world in which we live today. I mean, you got wars over there in the, uh, the Middle East. You, got, uh, uh, you have the wars with Europe. You have uh, uh, Russia that's, in, in, that's at, they're at war with Ukraine. You turn around and you got uh, uh, China that's getting ready to go to war with Taiwan. And, and then you see what happened in Israel and you have that war. And, and I, I would have never thought in a million years that you'd have people out there protesting against the nation of Israel after they were the ones that were mugged 
and uh, attacked on a, a one day. And, they, and, they took, try, and, and this happened. They, they're at war. They're at war. But there's all kinds of battles that are out there. And uh, when it comes to warfare, I want you to know that God is for us in warfare. Uh, there's a couple guys that we're going to look at in our message as we go through here. Um, how about uh, Gideon? Anybody ever heard of Gideon before? He's found in Judges chapter 7. And uh, he's a scaredy cat, okay? He's, he's one of these guys that are always <laughs> worried, you know, this isn't going to work or whatever like that. But God calls him because the Midianites who have 130,000 troops are coming down to bear down upon Israel to, to take away their land and to, and, and to uh, confiscate it and take hostages. And so there's that battle. And God calls a guy by the name of Gideon to, st to defend the nation of Israel. And we're going to read about him in just a little bit. Not only that, there was another story in uh, second, or first Samuel. First Samuel chapter 17. A guy by the name of David. All right? David had a big battle, literally a big battle. He was going up against a giant who was nine feet tall. And it's interesting, they would come out every day and they would uh, taunt each other. And uh, uh, Israel didn't want to fight against the Philistines at that time. Not this nine foot tall guy, no way and stuff. And David's going to step up and he's going to make a, a difference. Uh, and friends, I can tell you this. There's all kinds of battle, battles that are out there. Uh, when it comes for uh, God is for us in warfare. Not only that, there are two kinds of warfare. Two kinds. And we just talked about one kind. That's physical warfare. Literal battles that go on. Physical warfare. By the way, let me say this. Uh, just just a, kind of a side note. Um, when you see the, uh, the nation of Israel when they were attacked, it was by the Hamas government. All right? I find it very interesting. You know the word Hamas occurs in the Bible? It's a Hebrew word. Matter of fact, the first time it occurs is in Genesis chapter 6. You don't read anything about that, but all of a sudden in Genesis chapter 6, that word Hamas comes up a couple of times. Matter of fact, it comes up in Ezekiel 28 when God is describing Lucifer when he was thrown from heaven. And that word Hamas is used there as well. It's very interesting when you study scripture, you'll find out that the word Hamas deals with violence. That's what it means. It's violence. And who would name a government violence? Unbelievable. And I believe that we're living in the last days just for things like this. It says, as it was in the days of Noah, Genesis 6, that's the days of Noah, is when he's building a boat. God tells him to build a boat. And he says, uh, how big you want it to be? He said, well, it's going to be a big boat, all right? So it's going to be a large one. Anybody ever see the one in Kentucky? All right, good. That's pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's Im incredible. It's like going to the Grand Canyon. I don't know if you've ever been to the Grand Canyon. You can take all the pictures you want, but they just don't do justice. When you see it, I mean, right there visually, to be able to observe it and stuff is just unbelievable. It's incredible. And the same with the ark as well. And so in Genesis 6, God wants uh, Noah to build a boat. But let's go back before that. When we talk about wars and battles, we've we got to go all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis is the story of beginnings, all right? It's all about the beginning of the heavens and the earth, the beginning of uh, mankind, the beginning of marriage, uh, the beginning of, uh, of uh, languages, uh, the beginning of sin. And it starts in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 1 and 2, you have God creating the heavens and the earth and bringing everything together. He takes a man and places him in the most perfect environment in all the world. And bear in mind, remember, the most perfect environment in the world, the Garden of Eden. He gives him a wife, right? Her name is Eve. She's also placed in the Garden of Eden with him, all right? And uh, things are going great, all right? They're going wonderful. And then all of a sudden in Genesis chapter 3, God tells, him, <clears throat> tells Adam, before Eve was ever created, what he could eat and what he couldn't eat. He said there's a tree in the midst of the garden. It's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do not eat of that tree. It's one, one commandment, all right? Here we got all these laws in the Old Testament. We even got the Ten Commandments. But this is one, there's one thing that he said. You can eat of any tree, any tree. Look at the abundance of what God has provided for them. Any tree, except one tree. It's called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let's Adam know where it's at. There it is. Don't eat of that tree, all right? And then all of a sudden in Genesis chapter 3, Eve, who is a very dedicated wife, all right? She's out doing a little grocery shopping in the garden, going back and forth. 
getting, uh, picking from different trees and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, she goes down one aisle and looks, and, and there's the tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And she's wondering, what's so special about this tree that we can't eat from it? Tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's so special about it? So she gets a little closer and a little closer, and all of a sudden, Satan appears in the form of a serpent. I don't know if you've read the story or not or whatever. Some people say a woman would run from a state. Well, eventually you'll see why <laughs> that happens. But uh, anyways, uh, she goes down and takes a look at the tree, and all of a sudden uh, Satan, in the form of a serpent, drops out and looks at her, and he says something to her. You know what he says to her? He says, save. You want some fruit? It's on special today, and this is coupon day, right? All right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take some of that fruit. So what does she do? She partakes of the fruit. She takes it, gives it to Adam. He partakes of the fruit. And then God comes. God comes. And when God comes, he's asking. He's, he's calling out, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And let me say this. God never asks questions for information. When he asks questions, it's for examination. He finds out. Adam says, I'm over here. And the Lord says, what are you doing over there? And he's... He says, well, we're, we were naked and we were ashamed and they're hiding in the bushes. And God realizes that they have sinned. And so God challenges them on their sin that's happened. What happened? And Adam says, uh, the woman you gave me, she made me do it. Can you believe that? He's a victim. He's going to blame it on the woman. I mean, where would we be without women today, huh? We'd be back in the Garden of Eden. That's where we'd be. No, I'm just, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> But he said the woman had deceived him. And so uh, that's psychology 101. Never take blame. You're the victim, right? We're going to put the blame on somebody or something else. And that's what he did. He put it on Eve. And then Eve, I'm sure she was crying, tears coming down. Glad, good she didn't have mascara on or anything like that. But she said, the snake made me do it, right? And uh, the snake... Uh, he didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. But I, I can say this. I can say this. After that happened, ever since then, uh, women have been scared of snakes. Ever since then, women have been scared of snakes, and men have been scared of women. All right, so that's what happens when you rebel against God. So what does God do? He removes them from the Garden of Eden. He covers them. He lets him know that someday, one day, he'll take care of this. And there are curse and blessings that are passed on to each and every one of them. Part of the curse was a prophecy that was given in the Old Testament, the very first prophecy. In Genesis 3, it says that the, the seed of a woman would come and crush the head of Satan. He would crush Satan's head. You'll never see the seed of a woman again. It, it, it only occurs at one time. It's the seed of Abraham and Isaac and the seed of Jacob and the seed of David. But the seed of a woman, he's re referencing the virgin birth that would happen one day where Jesus would come up on a divine seek and save rescue mission, go to the cross and stretch his arms as wide open, and he who knew no sin would become sin for us and die for us there upon the cross. And he would crush the head of Satan. He would deal with that sin that happened in the Garden of Eden. And so it's, it's interesting that we see what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Then we move over to Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis 6, you've got Noah. That's when God comes to him and says, I want you to build a boat. How big? Well, it's not going to be a, a venture for weekends uh, to be able to take off and be able to do this. You're going to have to spend, he spent 100 years building that boat. Why? Because God was going to destroy the world. I just told you the word Hamas occurs right there in Genesis 6, two times, right off the bat. Not because of all the greed and, and, and horrific things that were going on, but because of the violence as well that existed in that, in that uh, era. And so God destroyed the entire world and started with just uh, Noah and his family coming off the ark in Genesis chapter 9. You get over to chapter 10, there's the, the beginning of governments that's happening. Genesis chapter 11, when God says to spread out and multiply and fill the earth, what do they do? Once again, they rebel against God. They rebel against God. So what, what do they do? They came together. They would not depart. They said, let's come together and let's, let's build a, tow, a, a tower that will go up into the heavens and stuff. And it was the, the Tower of Babel. And finally, God said, enough is enough. So what did he do? He confounded their languages. What's that mean? That means uh, there were people that could speak French the very next day who couldn't speak French the day before that. 
They can speak German, they can speak English, they can speak Pig Latin, you name whatever language you want to that's out there. And he confounded their languages to where they would have to spread out and go across and, and depart from there. And so that, that happened. And then Genesis uh, 11 is the Tower of Babel. And then you get to Genesis chapter 12 and you read about a guy by the name of Abram. And this is where everything changes in scripture. You need to understand Genesis 12. Matter of fact, did I tell you to turn to Genesis 12? Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, there are a couple of verses I want you to see, and then we're going to go over to Genesis 14 because they make a significance in Abram's life. Genesis chapter 12, God is for us, but look what it says here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And eventually he says, I'm going to give you that land. That's a promise that he gives. That's a personal blessing. I'm going to give you this land. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. That's not only a personal blessing, but that's a national blessing that's going to happen right there. And he says, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in all families of the earth, and, uh, and you and all, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Wow. That's the promise that God makes to Abraham. And what it's called is an unconditional covenant. Now, when I was in seminary, we learned all these little definitions and terms. You got conditional covenants and you got unconditional covenants. The Mosaic covenant, that was a conditional covenant. You do this, this, and this, and I'll do this, this, and this. That's what he'd say to the people of the nation of Israel. Unconditional, that was a conditional covenant. But Abraham had an unconditional covenant. Matter of fact, uh, he shows him that he was going to give him the land. That was unconditional. All right? We're going to see in the passage today how this happens. Not only that, he said he would, he said that uh, he would have a great nation and things like that. Matter of fact, he, he, his descendants, a guy by the name of David, comes from Abraham, all right? So he would be blessed through that. Then he says all nations on the earth would be blessed as well. I think we're living in that time period today as well. So in here, God is for us. And when he's for us, he's for us in wealth and uh, warfare. Genesis 14, if you'll turn over just a couple pages now from Genesis 12. We've gone from Adam and Eve to Noah, all right, over to the Tower of Babel to where God gives Abraham in chapter 12, he gives him an unconditional covenant that he's going to work through. Because you'll find out Abraham still had sin in his life. There are things that happened in his life, and God still blessed him. But God was uh, faithful in all that he told him he would do. God is for us in warfare. There are two kinds of warfare, and we saw the first one is a physical warfare. Physical warfare. We saw the battle against uh, sin that happened in the, in the garden. Um, there's, uh, in Genesis 6, all the uh, bad things that are happening through there and stuff. That's, but there's physical warfare. But there's not only physical warfare. All, all warfare begins with spiritual warfare. It begins with the heart. It's a heart issue is what happens. It's a heart issue. Now, what's interesting is uh, not only are there two kinds of warfare, but there are two kinds of warriors, two kinds of warriors. And we're going to be introduced to how Abraham uh, uh, dealt with a problem that came up really quickly um, under, under him. Uh, he's, moved, he's gone to the place that God has showed him. All right, God has always sh already showed him the land. I'm going to give you all this land, and as far as you can see, and and then we get to Genesis chapter 14. Now you got to understand when Abraham went and left Ur of Ch Chaldees to go to this prom this new land. <clears throat> there's a nephew of his that goes with him. His, his name is Lot. This is Abraham's brother, Abram's brother's son that goes with him. So he's with him. All right, here in, G in Genesis chapter 14, you have this battle that's taking place. And this battle is against a couple of cities. I want to name them, Sodom and Gomorrah, all right? Now, Sodom and Gomorrah are really, they're, they collaborate with three other nations. There are five nations that are taking the defense because they're under attack by these four nations. Now, if you'll look down in here, look at verse 8. Look at verse 8 of chapter 14. It says, And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adama, the king of Zebulun, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and joined together in battle in the Valley of Sidium. All right? Uh, the Valley of Sidium is, uh, got some asphalt pits, some slime pits or whatever. But anyways, they go to battle there. And look who they're going to fight against. Now, I I'm going to have a hard time saying a couple of these names, all right? So don't make fun of me, all right? When you got like six syllables in your name, it's hard to pronounce it, all right? But in here, he says, 
He's, he, they're going to go into battle against Cheddar Dorlam or whatever, king of Elam, Vital, king of the nations, Amphrel, king of Shinar, and Erech, king of Elarzar. And he goes out of the way to let us know there's four kingdoms against how many? Against five. Four kingdoms against five kingdoms. All right? Now, on paper, who should win that battle? The five kingdoms should win, right? And that's what they were taking. I mean, here they were. They were paying this tax and tribute, and, and they finally got tired of it, and they quit doing it. So these four kings came up. They were the ones receiving it, and they came up to demand it to get it or to, take their, to, to, to overthrow their country. And so they, they had these five countries that come together, these five kingdoms, and they go up and battle against these four, and guess who wins? The four do. The smaller group of men, they, they win that battle. They win that battle. And there's reasons why they won the battle. There are two kinds of warriors. Let me give you the first kind of warrior. There are self-dependent warriors. Self-dependent. In here, it's interesting because Abram is going to get involved in this situation. Why? Because they take when they lost the battle, Sodom and Gomorrah, the five nations, they took Lot with them. They took him as a captive. They took his goods with them, his, his uh, uh, livestock and things. They took that with them as well. And so now it became personal to Abram. So what does Abram do? He calls out his military, his mighty men. And it says they're trained. And I think it's interesting that it would emphasize that they are trained. Trained in what? Milk and cows? Is that what it was? No. These guys were trained for battle. They were ready. And it was 318 guys that he took together. And they're going to go into battle against, against four kingdoms that defeated five kingdoms? you got to be kidding me. Well, in here, let me tell you this. There are two kinds of warriors. They're self-dependent. First of all, there are those that trust in their own sufficiency. Trusting in their own sufficiency. When they trust in their own sufficiency, it's kind of interesting. Um, when you trust in their own sufficiency, listen, listen what uh, Scripture says. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from who? Our sufficiency is from God. And so they were going into battle, especially the, uh, the five nations, thinking that we're sufficient, we're good enough. And God says, That's, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Let me give you a story at the beginning I started with. A guy by the name of Gideon. Gideon was called by God to defend the nation of Israel. They're going to be overwhelmed pretty soon. 135,000 Midianites were going to show up. And they needed to be ready to fight against these 135,000 guys. You know, they need to make sure that they're sufficient. And so Gideon kept testing the Lord. He says, okay, if you really want me to serve then, okay, I'm going to lay out a, a, uh, a sheepskin right here, okay? And uh, tomorrow when I wake up, if you really want me to do this, it needs to be dry underneath and the water be on top of that sheepskin. Guess what happened? He wakes up the next day, feels underneath there, it's dry as a bone, and the top is all wet. It's like, oh, all right, wait a minute. Maybe I, I, I should reverse that, right? So what's he do? He's okay, all right, all right, all right, you got me there, all right, let's do it this way, all right? If you really want me to fight, put the dew back underneath it and make it dry on, on, on top, right, and stuff. And what happens the next day? The dew's underneath there, and the top is dry. He recognizes God wants him. And so he's ready to go to battle. So he goes to battle and he puts out a message to the whole nation of Israel. If you can come and fight, we're, we're going to defend our nation. We need you to come to be able to fight with us. And so after that message goes out, there are 32,000 men that show up. Now, how many Midianites are there? A hundred and how many? 135,000 Midianites that they're getting ready to attack him. And he only has 32,000 men. So he's saying, okay, I know there's a God. He's a big God. He's, he showed me signs and wonders and things in my, in my tent. And so I'm, I'm going to believe that God's going to take these 32,000 men and we're going to defend Israel. Let's do it, right? And so they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then God says, hey, you know what? You got too many men. You, you got to send some of them home. And he goes, too many men? As I understand, they got a huge army coming in against us. There's no way. There's no way. We're, we, we're outnumbered already, right? 
He says, why don't you let the guys who are afraid be able to go home to, back to their families? Now, Gideon should have been one of those. He was a scaredy cat, all right? He was always putting God to the test. But he makes the statement, all right, if you're afraid, if you're a sissy, go on home. 22,000 men turned and marched and headed off. How many does that leave? There's 10,000 that are left. 10,000. Oh, 10,000 against 135,000? We're outnumbered 13 men to one? And God says, I know you're probably not going to like this, but hey, you're still too big. It's like, what? Still too big? He said, yeah. You need to separate these guys. Matter of fact, let's take uh, every one we have, all 10,000 of you. We're going to go down to the river. And anybody that laps uh, the water out like a dog, you need to send them home. Take the guy who scoops it and picks it up and drinks it from his hand. Those are going to be your warriors. It's like, how many, Gideon's probably thinking, how many, how many guys are going to do this, right? So he takes these guys down to the lake. They don't even realize it. They're all thirsty. It's been, I mean, they're out in the middle of the sun and things like that, and they get down in there. And next thing you know, everybody's laughing at like a dog. Every one of them are laughing at like a dog. And they got, they got a couple of guys that are sitting around and drink, you know, drinking it and picking stuff out of it, make sure they didn't get germs and things like that. Now, let me ask you something. Have you heard some of the military commercials that are on TV even today? Be all that you can be. I don't want to go to battle with that guy. <laughs> Now, I want the guy who says, be all you can be, right? That's who you want, right? You want a man's man. You want to be able to go out there and fight and know he's got your back and everything's going to work out, right? And, and instead, he goes down there, and those guys are lapping it up like a dog, and you got a couple of guys that are going, oh, can't drink that right there. Just a little right there. So, no, I want to fight with the other guys. But God said, you have too many. Little did Gideon realize God wasn't even going to use swords or anything against this, this, these other guys. He was going to use trumpets and lights. And lo and behold, those 135,000 Mennonites came down against 300, 300 troops. That's all they had, 300, and they won the battle. You know what? That's sufficiency. Our sufficiency isn't of ourselves. Our sufficiency comes from God. We see that uh, trusting their own sufficiency... That's why they lost the battle. Another one, trusting their own strength. Their own strength. Um, I was talking about David just a little earlier. Remember the story of David? David goes out and uh, he sees Goliath. He's making fun of the nation of Israel. Send me a, send me a man, right? You know? And, uh, and David's waiting for somebody to go out there and whoop this guy. Go, someone go out and no one's doing it. And David finally says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? And so they find out about it. The king, King Saul, finds out, and he sends for David. Now, where's King Saul? He's back at the, uh, you know, the, the, the castle, all right? He's hanging out there. And why? Well, do anybody know why Saul became the king of Israel? He became the king of Israel because he was head and shoulders over everybody else. He was the tallest. He was the biggest. Who should have been the guy out there fighting Goliath? Right? So he shows up. David does. And they began talking, and he says, how are you going to fight against this? He said, well, let me, I'll, I'll be quite, quite frank, uh, uh, sir. Um, I fought against lions. I fought against bears. And I beat them both down. And if I can beat the lions and the bears, I can take on the giants any time on Sunday, right? Some of you get that a little later, all right. <laughs> what does he do? Saul wants to dress him up in his military gear. David said, I can't do it. I cannot fight like this. So he says, okay, you do it the way you want to do it. So he shows up at the field. Goliath comes out, makes that taunt against the nation of Israel. And here's David. He comes out, and he's got his little slingshot going right now, all right? And, and Goliath is making fight. He said, you come at me like, like with a dog with sticks, you know? And David says, no. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the name of the Lord of hosts. And, giants, and he, he's sitting there looking at him, Goliath. And then you know what he says? I'm, I'm going to use the exact vocabulary he used, all right? This is, this is how you speak in Philistine, right? Fee, fi, fo, fum. <laughs> he said, you, can't, you don't know what that means, do you? He says this, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. When you come up, he doesn't know who Jesus is or who the Lord is. 
And here's David swinging that slingshot. He takes off running, and David takes off running right after him. And what does he do? He lets that stone go. Ask Goliath if there's a God in heaven or not. Oh, you won't see him in heaven. God defended him. And you know where David's strength came from? His strength came from the Lord. That's what he says. He says in uh, Ephesians 6, 10, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So we see that uh, they were self-dependent. You know what? They're not only self-dependent uh, warriors. They're, they're God-dependent warriors. God-dependent warriors. One of them is Abraham right here. What did he do? Abraham trusted the word of God. Abraham trusted the word of God. You say, where does it say that in there? Well, you got to go back to chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. What did he tell him? I'm going to bless you. All nations of the earth will be blessed through you. If they curse you, they'll be cursed. But if they bless you, they'll be blessed as well. And he lays out that unconditional covenant that's given back in Genesis chapter 12. And what does, most, uh, what does Abram know? Abram knows this. There's no way God's going to let me die if he's going to do all these things for me. And so he goes into battle. He's willing to take 318 men into battle against four kings that defeated five kingdoms. And so he trusted God's word. He trusted God's word. Not only did he trust God's word, he triumphed God's way. Never tells how he won the battle. Doesn't say there was any slingshots or swords or anything like that. It just says he won the battle. And he captured Lot and he brought Lot back home. Not only did he do that, he brought back some of the other people that were taken hostage, such as the king of Sodom. He came back with them as well. But he triumphed God's way. Matter of fact, uh, look at 14, chapter 14, verse 21. It says, Now the king of Sodom, and S Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. What? what? Ta take the, the uh, let me, give me the persons and you keep the spoils that are there and stuff. Could you imagine Abram saying, um, hey, come here. I know you're a king. Come over here. All right. Did you, did you just have a f fight with these guys? A battle? Yeah. Okay, all right. Did you win? <laughs> you did, huh? And this is interesting. Look what he says in here after that. He says uh, in verse uh, 22, But Abram said to the king of Sodom, and Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I, will take, uh, that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Wow. It ain't going to happen. He's going to let the people go free. They go back, go back to Sodom, and they went back to Sodom as well. You see, in here, he triumphed God's way. The world has a way, like the king of Sodom, of what's in it for me. I know he's not going to give me the spoils or anything like that, but at least he can give me the people back. i got to have people if I'm going to have a kingdom. And so that's why he says, just give me the people right there. So that's the world talking. But not only do we see the world talking, but we see uh, what a worshiper says. You know what a worshiper says? Look what it says in verse 22. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a, sa a, thread to a sandal strap, and that I would take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. In essence, he wanted to know how he could, uh, as a worshiper of God, how God would be glorified. How is God going to be glorified? You know what it means to glorify God, don't you? Anybody know what it means to glorify God? It's interesting. They have those on uh, buildings and uh, things like that. You know, the sole purpose of man is to what? Glorify God. I, I see it all the time. See it at churches, see it there. When I was in Bible school, I remember our professor asked that. Um, he was talking about that. What, what is the, he'd say this, what is the sole purpose of man? And people came up with all kinds of answers. Whether it was going soul winning on Monday nights or whether it was uh, reading your Bible through once a year or whether it was uh, whatever, all right? Had all these different answers for it. Um, and then he'd say, those are all good, but that's not the sole purpose. He'd say this, the sole purpose of man is this, to glorify God, to glorify God. I got my Bible open that day. I wrote in the front, sole purpose of man, glorify God, all right? That was in Bible college. I took the same guy in seminary. It was a graduate school, and uh, it, was only, it was guys only type classroom, about 15 of us in there. <laughs> and Dr. Appman says this, what is the sole purpose of man? 
I couldn't believe it, the same question. I got, I got the answer right here in the front of my Bible, right? And people were standing up, go soul winning every Monday night, you know, go read your Bible through, all these different things, right? And, so, and I stood up, I said, <clears throat> the sole purpose of man is to glorify God. He said, that's great, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? I have no clue, all right? I know it's to glorify God, but I, you know what? And he said this, and, and by the way, I, never had, I didn't even have to write this down. To glorify God is when you make the invisible God visible in your life to a watching world. Let me say that one more time. Making the invisible God visible in your life to a watching world. That's what it means to glorify God. Makes all the difference. You know what? Your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, when you talk to them about God, they don't read the Bible. They don't read the Bible. Oh, they may tell you they've read it or whatever like that, but they, they, they don't read the Bible. You know what they do? They look at your life and see if Christ makes a difference. That's what it means to glorify God. In here, he triumphed God's way. He was a worshiper. And he, how, how, will he, uh, how will God be glorified? Not only that, notice what happens in verses 18 through 20. It says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the God of the Most High. Let me ask you something. When do we use bread and uh, uh, unfermented wine? <laughs> when do we use that? Yeah, the Lord's Supper. When we have the Lord's Supper. And by the way, these are not, vi these are not symbols of defeat. When Jesus died on the cross and he cried out, it is finished, the night before they took the Lord's table, the bread and the wine. and Those are symbols of victory. Every time we have the Lord's Supper, we need to look back and realize that what Christ did for us, he gave us the victory over sin when he went to the cross and took our place. And so we see that. So in this passage here, we see that Melchizedek comes out, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High guy, God. And by the way, it's interesting, the priesthood is separated when it comes to the nation of Israel. But in here, you have a priest and a king that come together. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who hath delivered your enemies into your hands. And watch this. And here's what Abraham does. And he gave him a tenth of all. Here's for the first time ever, the word tithe occurs in Scripture. He gave him a tenth of all. Now, how many have gone to church and you've heard of the statement, what, what to tithe? How many know what that is? Just raise your hand real quick right there. All right, yeah. It's not more than that made New Year's resolutions, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's a, the, the word, a tenth right there, it's a tithe. And it's not a theological term, it's a mathematical term. And so he comes back, and this is before the law, this is before they're under any law or anything like this. And what does he do? He honors God by giving him a tenth of all that he has. That's what he does. He tithes. We learn later on in Leviticus, when they are, are under the law, it says the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is the Lord's. He says that. It's holy unto the Lord. Not only is the tithe the Lord, to be quite frank, the whole earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's as well. Well, in here, we've kind of looked at uh, what it means in, uh, that God is for us. Not only is God for us in warfare, but God is for us in welfare as well. He's for us in welfare. Now, in fact, there's an unfortunate chapter division in uh, chapter 14 and 15. They really go together, hand in hand right here. Because after, after Abram has defeated these kings, after he has set those people free, the people to go back to their own lands and things like that, <clears throat> what happens? He's looking over his shoulder from that point. Matter of fact, he gives a tenth of his offering, of all that he has, to Melchizedek. So what's God going to do? And you know what? God answers this question that he's thinking about in chapter 15, verse 1. Look what it says in chapter 15, verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. In here he's letting him know not only is he there for him for warfare, God is for us, but also in welfare. He wants to make sure that Abram's going to be fine. He's going to be fine. And so what does God promise him? He promises him to be, that he would be his protector. Look what he says. Do not be afraid. I am your shield. God is telling Abram, I got your back. Don't worry about it. I got your back. You're going to be fine. Not only do I have your back, look what he says in the very next statement. 
Do not be afraid that I am your shield. And I love what he said. He doesn't just say, I, and, and your reward. I guess, I guess he could say that. I'm your reward. But it goes further. Your great reward. Another uh, uh, superlative. Exceeding great reward. That's what he is to us. He's our protector and our provider. You know, when the Christian understands this, that God is for them, when you make New Year's resolutions and the battles you fight and things that you're going to deal with and stuff, God's going to give you the victory. You have a divine edge when you go along with what God has planned for you in your life. The challenge is that uh, each and every one of us, you know, I've heard people make statement, God's all I need. Well, let me ask you something. How do you know if he's all you need? How do you know that? I can say this, when Abraham lost everything, lost some of these things here and was looking over his back, God was all he had. And sometimes you have, God has to take everything from you and you lose everything. And when he's all you have, then you'll know if he's all you need. And that's what Abraham needed right there. He needed a message to give him a divine edge that God would be with him and for him. God is with us. Let's pray together. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, maybe this is the time for you to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. God loves you more than anything in this world. He's promised to never leave you or forsake you. He is your great reward. You know, it's interesting, we just came out of Christmas as well, and we think about Christmas gifts and all the presents that were given, and the one gift that usually gets left behind is the one that God has given to each and every one of us. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If you're here today, you don't, you've never prayed to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's the most important decision you could ever make. That's how much God loves you. God loves you unconditionally. People think, you don't know my life, Gary. It doesn't matter what I know. It's what God knows. And God says, I still love you. I love you more than anything. I sent my son to take your place on the cross. That's what he did. If you're here today, you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's as easy as A, B, C to know that heaven is your home. You say, how can it be that simple, Brother Gary? God has made it that way. A, you have to admit you can't do this on your own. That's the hard part. You can't be sufficient of yourself. It's not of you. It's of what God has done for you, how he gave his son. B, you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. That he was removed from that cross after he died and was buried. But that's not the end of the story. He rose again the third day and that changed everything. And he's offering salvation to all who will believe. You willing to believe today? And then C, are you willing to confess him as not just Savior, but Lord and Savior? That's what he wants. He desires that, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. There's nothing magical or mystical about the words I'm going to say. But if you're here without Christ, you've seen what God can do. He saw what he did for Abram here. We looked and saw what he did with, uh, with Gideon and his 300 men army. We saw what he did with, with David. And I can tell you this, being a Christian in this culture and in this day and age is going to be very, it's going to be very difficult and it's going to get harder each year. But God has given you that divine edge. He's made that promise that I am with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, maybe you'd pray something like this. Heavenly Father. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. I believe he was buried, and I believe he rose again the third day. And right now, Jesus, the best I know how, I asked you to forgive me of my sin. I asked you to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior today. I give you my life to do with it as you please. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, if, if you prayed that, I want to challenge you. I, I have a resource. We have some resources up here on the front row in the chairs. We, he's, we also have met the uh, Welcome Center. But it's a little book called Welcome to the Family. It'd be great for you to start getting into there and find out the, some of the decisions that you just made today. That God will never, never, never let you go. That he has you in his hands. And his father has him in his hands. So he's never going to let you go. You say, Brother Gary, I, I can't be perfect. None of us are. 
not a one of us. But God looks at us and has taken care and dealt with the sin question. And you've settled that today. Lord, I want to thank you for all that you do. Father, for those that maybe make some decisions today, that they're going to be in church more often. It's not going to be a once a month thing, but if, it, if they're, they're able to do this, that they would be more frequent. That, Father, they're going to get in and maybe if they were doing devotions, maybe just on Sunday, that, Father, you would challenge them that they'd be able to dive in and get into the word of God and what it has to say, your plan and purpose for their life. Father, that you would challenge each and every one through your spirit today, that because they have spiritual gifts and abilities, that they wouldn't let those just sit on the side and sing, and we sing about the sweet by and by when it's a very difficult world in which we live. And there are people that need the gifts and abilities you've given to each and every one of us to make that difference in this world. We just want to thank you, praise you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. If you would take the card holders at the end of the aisle there and pass those down for us. If you're new with us, if you'll fill out the front of that card with any information that you'd like to give us, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better and tell you more about us. If you came this morning prepared to give, you can place that in the offering envelope there and place that in the basket here in just a few moments when they're passed. You can also text SHBC to 73256 and they'll send you a link where you can give that way as well. On the back of that card is for prayer requests. Uh, as Gary's talked about this morning, there's a lot of warfare that we go through, both physical and spiritual. And so we want to be able to come alongside you uh, and pray about those things. And the song we sang earlier said, in, uh, it says, if this life brings suffering. And we know that life brings a lot of suffering. So we would love nothing more than to pray with you over those things. So if you'll fill out the back of that card, you can place it in the, ba in the baskets when they're passed here in just a few moments as well. A couple of announcements I'd like for you guys to know about tonight at 5 o'clock uh, here at the Side Daisy campus. We're going to be having our membership class. If you've been uh, visiting for a little while and you have some questions about what we believe, why we believe those things, we'd love for you to come and be a part of that, and we'll answer some of those questions for you. Also, uh, by the time we meet next Sunday, Night to Shine will have occurred. And so as you fill out prayer requests and as you pray this week, if you'll pray for us as well, uh, we'll have 150 guests here on Friday night that we're looking so forward to hosting, uh, to celebrating with them, and to sharing the gospel with them. And so uh, one of the things that Tim Tebow always says in the videos that he does is that uh, he wants these folks to know that there's people in their community that love them, and that's us. But more importantly, there's a God in heaven that loves them as well and sent his son to die on a cross for them. So if you'll be praying with us, there's going to be a lot of setup. On Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, no, not Saturday, well, surely we'll be done Friday night, but if you'll just be praying for everything to go smoothly and for these folks to know that they're loved by us and by God, uh, we would really appreciate that. Let's go ahead and have the ushers come forward. We'll prepare to receive the offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are for us. Father, we thank you that you have given us your word that is so clear that, uh, that you love us and that you for, are for us. So, Father, help us to feel your presence as we, as we go through this life, as we suffer. Father, help us to remember that you're there. Help us to feel your presence. Father, I pray for our church family this upcoming Friday. Father, I just pray that you will help us to love on our guests. Help us to love on our community. Help us to love on the caregivers that will come with our guests. Father, we just pray that you will be glorified. We pray that your presence will be felt in and around this building the entire night and this entire week. Father, we just pray that you'll be glorified. Father, take this offering, use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
we're going to sing a song together. Uh, matter of fact, if you have a 10-year-old or under and they would like to come up and sing with us, would you go ahead and let them come right now? Now, we are checking ID. You have to be 10 and under, all right? <laughs> so, anybody like that? We got a, a little one or whatever? Come on. You'll be fine, sweetheart. Come on up. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> all right. This is Blakely, and I've asked her to sing. Let's all stand. We're going to sing a song called Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Ready? Here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Give her a hand. Thank you, sweetheart. You're dismissed. See you all next week. <laughs>